Oh, good afternoon. Thanks, uh, everybody, for uh, coming along and for spending a long day listening. Um, this is a celebration of Water Festival, and my hat off especially to Bill Shoddock, whose boundless enthusiasm has put this thing together, and I think that's pretty damn amazing. You know, astrologically speaking, I'm a Cancer, and that's for those of you who don't follow these things. That's a water sign. So that's kind of right up my alley, this. And uh, I'm just going to tell you something really funny that happened on the way up here to this wonderful community of Elmvale, except the traffic was a complete nightmare, so I'm just going to skip that. There was absolutely nothing funny about the ride up. <laughs> so instead, I'm going to just start by, I want to read to you just a really little brief passage. And thank you. You're going to have to pay really close attention because there's a pop quiz coming at you right after. And there's all kinds of points awarded for right answers. <clears throat> so I'm quoting now from a brief passage from a book. So many casualties in such a short stretch of time suggested a central contaminated water source used by large numbers of people. He needed to get samples of the water while the epidemic was still at full force. And so he made the journey into the belly of the beast. Okay, pop quiz time. Anybody would like to take a stab at what that was referring to? Come on. Moby Dick. No, no points on that? That's we hear. Five points for this gentleman. In case anybody didn't hear, we're talking about a cholera epidemic that broke out in the great city of London, and I'm talking about London, England, in 1857. 1854, excuse me. So now I'm going to read another really short passage, and again, pay careful attention because this gentleman has got five points. And we'll see where this one comes from. Each member of the team, and I'm quoting now, called out the address of the patients from their share of the line listings. And as each address was named, he used a yellow marker to highlight a large map. And that map was pinned up on one side of the wall. And by the end of the exercise, the entire map was covered in yellow. It can only be the water, someone said, and everybody nodded. Now, a world away in a hospital in London, 66-year-old Lenora L., who was a retired library worker, passed away. Does anybody care to guess what that passage referred to? Legionnaire's disease? Eh. Z zero points. Anybody else? Come on, you were smart the first time. Try it again. See if you can get 10 points. There's bonus if you get this one. <laughs> He's got all the points, guys. Yes, that was from the walks and water tragedy. So, 15 points. I think you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> we all know by now the, the sorry, sad tale of Walkton in the year 2000, and that seems such a long time ago, when an E. coli epidemic swept through the town. But I think it's kind of eerie the similarities between London, England in 1854 and Walkerton in 2000. You know, and I was asked to talk today, uh, Bill invited me along to talk a little bit about uh, the Walkerton water tragedy, and I covered that extensively as a journalist, um, and later when I wrote the book Well of Lies. And the more I pondered the topic, the more I was struck by the parallels between what happened then, back oh, 150 odd years ago, that big cholera outbreak, and the Walkton water outbreak. So let's talk a little bit about this, because I think looking at both epidemics is actually quite instructive. Back in London, back then of course, there was barely a sewage system to speak of. You know, we had no indoor plumbing essentially. London back then was a city of three million people, so we're not talking you know, a little, little community. 
It was a pretty substantive city. In fact, it was the biggest city in the world at the time. For their drinking water, many of the people would actually let the sewage water settle. Let the sewage water settle, and they just scoop up the top when it was cleared and they drink it. Ew. That's what they did back then. Kind of hard to believe now, but you know what? Way back then, they hadn't really had a good grasp of things like bacteria. The microscope was around, but nobody had actually seen bacteria looking around and identified them in water. And so the idea that water could make you ill was pretty much science fiction. Okay. What's more interesting to some extent is that people thought disease was spread by smell. If it smelled bad, you were going to get sick from it. Similarly, in Walkerton, nobody initially believed the water would make you ill, right? This is pretty, pretty silly when you think about it, but not really, because for one thing, it had never happened before in a chlorinated municipal water system, right? So nobody thought about water. Now, how did the London epidemic start, this cholera outbreak in 1854? Well, the one child got sick, and cholera does not very pleasant things to one's body, and this infant was ill. The mother would be washing the infant's diapers in a pail of water, and then not being any handy-dandy indoor plumbing to get rid of this stuff, she'd take the slop bucket and she'd basically pitch it outside the front of the house, which was very common practice back in this city of three million people back then. And what happened was that contaminated water from the sick infant, one person was ill, seeped through the ground into a well. And people would come from all around the area to this particular well because the water was known to be good tasting water and they pumped the water. And then they drink the water and whoosh, cholera epidemic, such as the country had never seen before. In Walkton, how did Walkton happen? Cow manure seeping into a well. Farmer kept up a really good farm. Nobody really thought this was going to happen. The well was known to be vulnerable, but nobody paid any attention. And from there, this well, the water in this well was pumped around the town and everybody ended up drinking it. So, just like nobody thought in London that it could be water making them ill, in Walkerton nobody thought so, because the prevailing wisdom until Walkerton happened, essentially, not just in Walkerton, but everywhere, was that deep well water was invariably clean. It's the cleanest kind of water you could drink. Now, how did they solve these mysteries? You've got to remember they didn't have the kind of sophisticated testing that we had. So. Going back to London, that big cholera outbreak, there was a very open-minded and inquisitive doctor, and he concluded, he concluded that there was a problem with the water, but how he did that was pretty interesting. His name was Dr. John Snow, and unless you're really into arcane topics of interest, nobody much remembers him now, but he and a local priest, Henry Whitehead, who knew the area, they unraveled the mystery despite a lot of skepticism, because everybody was thinking smells, by figuring out who got ill and then correlating it to where they got their drinking water from. He basically mapped out the illnesses in the town. In Walkerton, that's exactly how public health authorities isolated E. coli as the outbreak coming from the water, because they put up the map, and I just read you a little bit of that passage, found out who was ill, and of course that data was easily collected back in London time. You had to actually go knock on doors and say, can you tell me if anybody's died here or who's been sick? Then they had that information, they mapped it all out, and they figured out, well, wait a minute, it's got to be the water. In London, when he figured out it was the water, they get the handle of the pump taken off so people couldn't keep drinking. Seemed pretty 
pretty logical step to take. But guess what happened to the poor, poor guy that they sent to take the handle off the pump? They almost stoned him. They jeered. They scorned him. <laughs> right? Can't be the pump. What's the matter with you? Right? Same thing happened in Walkerton, essentially. A lot of finger pointing, open mistrust of authorities, governments, denials, accusations, passed back and forth. When Dr. Snow died way back when, initially nobody even mentioned the fact that he was the guy who solved the cholera epidemic. And his work has, has paved the way for a lot of things for which we can be grateful today. After Walkerton, nobody here has ever heard of Dave Patterson. Unlikely. But he was the public health unit guy who more than anybody else actually tracked down the cause of the E. coli outbreak in Walkerton. So, you know, some lessons we learn and some we don't. Let's talk about some of what we have learned. Dr. Snow's work back then formed the embryonic understanding of waterborne diseases. And more importantly, it set the scientific rationale for the need to separate human waste and animal waste from our drinking water. This might seem completely logical, but back then there was no scientific rationale for this stuff. In other words, the rationale for actually keeping our water clean. Just for the record, in case anybody's taking notes, 700 people died in the space of a couple of weeks in the London cholera outbreak. 700 people. In Walkerton, seven people died. Essentially in the same kind of time frame, although a few people lingered on. By population, per capita, in fact, the Walkerton outbreak was about five times as deadly as the one in London back then. Just to give you some sense of the impact that that had had. And that's pretty shocking when you consider this was a century and a half later and a pile of public health and services later. Okay? So what Walkerton showed, I think, to some extent, was that there were a bunch of lessons we hadn't learned. Question, another pop quiz. Well, it's less of a pop quiz. Did you know the water we drink today out of our taps or out of our bottles or whatever is essentially the same water that Adam and Eve peed in? Ew, yeah. We don't really go around making new water. We don't import crates of the stuff from the moon or someplace. Pretty much all the water we've got on this planet today is the same water that we had way back then. Right? So, we just keep recycling what we've got over and over again. Excuse me. And that's pretty amazing, if you really think about it. Pretty amazing. Um, just as a complete aside, if you listen to Bill Schotter talking this morning about some of the water that he's tested around here, you know, as clean as ancient Arctic ice water, or even cleaner perhaps, is a complete testament to how nature, normally speaking, is able to filter and clean and regenerate and help us recycle. Adam and Eve's water, the stuff they peed in, the stuff we still drink today. But, and here's the huge but in all of this, essentially, is that the ability of the natural environment to keep cleaning the water is limited. It's not going to keep happening, right? And it's getting worse and worse all the time because of the load that we're putting on it. And I mean, just consider, uh, you heard some in some of the previous presentations about parts per trillion and stuff, but something that I understand more clearly, take one gallon of gasoline, just a gallon, a little container, drop it into the Walkerton water system, for two weeks, that water is useless for drinking. One little contain. So when we're talking about more vicious stuff, like dioxins and all kinds of stuff, can you imagine, right? So what we do know is that it's a lot harder to clean water that's already been made dirty. And it doesn't matter if it's manure, human or animal, or chemicals, plastics, fire retardants, whatever than it is to keep the water clean in the first place. It's kind of like unscrambling the old proverbial omelet. Now some people might say, well, I don't, 
what's the big deal if the water's bad? We'll just drink the bottled water, right? Okay. I don't want to venture too far into this particular territory because the next speaker, I think, might have some rather irritating truth to talk about bottled water, but the fact is, what Walker has showed us is that groundwater can be so easily contaminated, a lot of the bottled water you drink comes from that same water source, number one. Number two, there are more regulations in place for your tap water than there are for your bottled water. Bottled water, the only thing they care about is on the label. And of course, I'm not even going to talk about the plastic bottles themselves and the huge environmental problems they cause, or the fact that if nobody drinks tap water, guess what's going to happen to it? Um, or what happens when for-profit companies all control the water that we drink? And going back to London, England for a second, why were these people throwing all their slops out on the street? One reason, and a big reason, was because the guys that used to come around and collect the stuff the crap collectors, were charging way too much money now to dispose of it because they had to ship it out where it could be used as manure on farm fields. And as the city grew, these poor guys coming around and collecting your buckets of slop had to go all these distances to get rid of it. So they were charging more and more, and the poor people, the people who didn't have enough money, screw that, out the window, right? Doesn't matter, not going to hurt. And so the same thing with drinking water. Prices go up. The thing is, you can opt, you can opt, you can choose not to drink beer. Well, most of us can, <laughs> not you. Uh, or you can give up your Coke, but you can't give up your drinking water. Anyway, I'm digressing here for a second. So the basic point that both London at that time and Walkerton teaches us is how important clean water is, both to our very survival and to our good health, but also how incredibly fragile this very precious resource is. And good things do flow from bad, though, right? What we do know is that there are millions of people around the world right now who have no access to clean water of any description. We know that millions die every single year from cholera and similar diseases. Kind of outrage, really. And of course, the predictions are all about that the next world war is going to be fought about drinking water, not about oil, but about water. So. Some of the good things that came out of, uh, out of London initially was uh, we have a sewage system was built almost in the immediate years when they finally realized that this was needed. They built a very elaborate sewage system and cholera epidemics essentially disappeared. They'd been a, re a, a fairly repetitive occurrence, none quite so bad as the one I've just talked about, but they disappeared finally once this was all in place. Walkerton has sparked a massive, a massive awareness across Canada across communities across this country, but also internationally. There's been huge, huge amounts of money and effort and time spent in upgrading the infrastructure, making sure that we keep our water clean in the first place. The recommendations that came out of the Walkerton Inquiry are being looked at and followed by, this go by governments in Ontario, but everywhere else as well. And so we already have, or are in the process of implementing some of the uh, toughest rules anywhere aimed at protecting source water and uh, you know once we've got source water out of the ground or out of the lakes treating it properly to ensure that it stays clean and healthy when it gets to our taps and of course all of this costs a huge amount of money it's very hard to do and of course it's absolutely vital because the downside to not doing this is disasters and problems many, many magnitude of orders bigger, or orders of magnitude bigger, not only in dollar terms, I mean, but we're talking about human suffering. When babies are dying, adults are dying, families are being ripped apart, ripped apart, you've got a very, very serious problem. Money doesn't repair that kind of stuff. Better to stop it from happening in the first place. So beyond this necessity for survival, good water, on the other hand, is a gentle, comforting luxury. And whether it's a warm bath, clean hands, cool drink, or a refreshing swim. And that's what today is about. And I think that's where we should stay focused, is that you know, we stop and think for a minute or two about something we generally take for granted every time we take a sip, we brush our teeth, take a shower, you know, go for a warm, we go for a swim, go for a warm bath, whatever. Today we're celebrating water, and I think it's uh, on a hot summer day like today, completely appropriate that we do so. And we do it in a community where the water under our feet 
literally under our feet, is so pristine still. Thanks very much. Anybody have any questions?